This is a story about cutting styrene with a lengthy tangent about gauge blocks and the nature of inductive reasoning. So a couple weeks ago I saw a call from a local machinist who does injection molding as a hobby. He had been working on making face shield frames, but the initial setup wasn't big enough to let it be done all at once. So he had been cutting strips of styrene, inserting them in the molds, and casting the various brackets around them. He needed someone to cut those strips for him so he could focus on the rest of the process, most importantly a second iteration that could cast the entire thing at once. Not having anything pressing going on, I said I'd see what I could do. The strips needed to be 10 millimeters wide, quite precisely 10 millimeters wide, actually, as they had to fit in the molds without letting molten plastic squirt out around them. He had been making them using 3D printed brackets to position a simple straight edge, then scoring with a utility knife. Styrene has this lovely property of snapping quite cleanly once you score it, so you can get surprisingly accurate results with a very simple setup. Since I wanted to be able to really crank them out, I decided to make a full jig. It had some scrap angle iron for a fence, and a bar of stainless steel as the straight edge. This was adjustable, so I could dial it in to be exactly parallel to the fence. It was a very quick build, and I set to work making strips. Or trying to, anyway. It was very hard to bend the strips to snap them off, since they were so narrow, so I made a quick tool out of some scrap wood to do that. Then I had to get the fence parallel. I ended up using my cheap gauge blocks for this. Great tools, gauge blocks. By far the most accurate and reliable tool you are ever likely to own. This set was being tossed out at my day job, and it's pretty beat up. But if they're in good condition, you can make them stick together, which is called rigging. This is convenient for making stacks for measurement purposes, but it also happens to be an intriguing lesson in the philosophy of science. First of all, we don't entirely know why ringing works. One immediate thought upon seeing it is that it must be air pressure. You've pushed all the air out from between them, so now there is a vacuum, and the atmosphere is pushing the blocks together, like very rigid suction cups. Unfortunately, this is easily disproved. It's not hard to find videos of people putting rung blocks in vacuum chambers, where they proceed to quite stubbornly not fall apart in the slightest. So a perfect example of the scientific method at work, right? A hypothesis, a simple test, and unambiguous results, which in this case disprove the hypothesis. The thing is, this experiment goes a long way back. It was actually one of the first ones performed when air pumps were invented back in the 17th century. At that time, the very concept of vacuum was bleeding-edge science. Aristotle had made it very clear that such a thing could not exist. Spatial dimension was, for him, defined by the objects in it. A vacuum would mean that volume of space simply not existing. There would be no there there. Anything placed in it would instantly emerge from the far side, along with several other contradictory behaviors that plainly showed the whole idea to be impossible. Later Christian philosophers extended this concept to see a vacuum as a blemish in the perfection of creation, a mote in God's eye, something so terrible that the very laws of nature would bend in order to prevent it from happening. Nature abhors a vacuum, right? That was meant very literally. If you use a wine thief to pull liquid out of a barrel, it should fall back down. Water finds its own level, after all. But doing so would create a vacuum and it was better that the liquid violate the normal laws of Aristotelian physics than allow a vacuum to be created. This was also how they explained why vessels filled with water cracked when the water froze. They assumed that water contracted as it became ice. Not an unreasonable assumption, given how unusual it is that water does the opposite. Thus, in a sealed vessel, the contraction of water as it froze would create a vacuum. To prevent this, the vessel would spontaneously crack, something it would otherwise never do. So, obviously, when a bunch of weirdos claimed that not only could a vacuum exist, but that they could make one using some arcane, and very expensive, device, it wasn't received well. And it's important to note that the scholastic philosophers weren't simply relying on the authority of Aristotle here. They could point at the results of empirical experiments to support their claims. Ring two ground and lap surfaces together, such as modern gauge blocks, and put them in your so-called vacuum. They don't fall apart. Therefore, it isn't actually a vacuum. Sure, you must be pumping something out, which happens to be important to candle flames and mice, but the real air, that subtle fluid, obviously still remains. I'm not actually claiming that they are right, please rest assured, but I do find it fascinating that the exact same experiment can lead people to such radically different conclusions. 
That shouldn't be possible according to the standard description of the scientific method. Induction may be the glory of science, but it remains the scandal of philosophy. Anyway, back to the styrene. I spent many, many hours working with the jig, trying to get reliable widths on the strips. Slowly I eliminated sources of errors. A single, moderately hard pass with the utility knife was best, being careful to keep the blade at the same angle. Use the wood tool to slowly start to ease the crack into forming. Not a violent snap. Those left jagged edges. This was particularly important at the ends, where the crack tended to race out of control. I thought maybe the fence and straight edge weren't straight enough, so I milled those flat, but it didn't help much. Then I realized that the fence itself was a bad idea. It made the entire edge of the sheet into a datum. Any errors on the previous cut pushed the whole thing away from the fence for the next cut, propagating that error. To fix this, I replaced the fence with two round discs, placed where I was getting the most reliable widths, and I very carefully dialed in the fence, measuring test strips and adjusting it with the gauge blocks. This finally converged to where I could fairly reliably get a strip whose width was within one-tenth of a millimeter of nominal, usually down around 10.05 millimeters. It wasn't exactly the mass production I had been dreaming of. I still needed to check each one with the micrometer. But the strips were needed, so I just buckled down and did it. The first night, I got 55 of the short ones done. The next day went faster, as I realized I could use the gauge blocks yet again. This time I made stacks with an ID of 10 millimeters and 10.1 millimeters. Yes, holding them in clamps like this is barbaric. Like I said, they're pretty beat up. This made a serviceable pair of go-no-go -no -go gauges. If the strip fits in the smaller gap, then it is too narrow and it is out of tolerance. If it does not fit within the larger gap, then it is too wide and again it is out of tolerance. Simple, reliable confirmation that they were or were not in the Goldilocks zone and a hell of a lot faster than checking them with a micrometer. So there they are, all the strips I got finished before the project was called off. They've now got the full injection molding system up and running, and they're cranking out hundreds every day. All the people 3D printing frames at home has been cool and inspiring, but it sure is hard to beat true mass production. Stay safe, everyone.